say a very hearty welcome or heartfelt welcome to Congressman Yvette Clark, who is joining us in this segment of Congressional Viewpoints. Welcome, Congresswoman Clark, as you are known to many of us as a daughter of Jamaica in the U.S. Congress. How are you? Thank you for having me, Dr. Nelson. I'm doing well, thanks. We want to start off by asking you, did you just choose to go into politics because you're following your mother's footsteps or is there some other more profound and deeper reason that we on the outside may not be aware of? Why did you decide to serve humanity through politics? It's so interesting because um, what a lot of people don't realize is that when Dr. Clark actually be, got into elective office, her, my brother and I were already grown adults. I attribute going into public service to the type of home and family that I was raised in, which was one that was very civic oriented, uh, very community oriented, and very service oriented. Um, I myself on a parallel track was uh, working at community-based nonprofit organizations in New York, other types of organizations that were doing community building, economic development, while simultaneously my mother was pursuing her political career. I, I just believe that it, within our home and family the, the passion for, for service was cultivated and uh, I don't know so much that I was following in my mother's foot, footsteps um, that it was something that was uh, premeditated <laughs> but certainly it was something that uh, when the time was right I felt prepared to do. Well, it's certainly good that we have a daughter of the Caribbean serving in the seat in Brooklyn you serve, which is known as the seat that Shirley Chisholm served in. But one of the questions I have always wanted to ask was, um, in terms of your serving a large the Caribbean district, what does, where perhaps the Caribbean is commonplace, what does it mean then to have a national, national space for celebrating the Caribbean American community. What does it mean? I think that my presence here in Congress speaks to, uh, coming from the constituency that I represent, speaks to a coming of age of a population of people who have been migrating, immigrating to the United States for generations now. Oftentimes, uh, those who are from the Caribbean can relate to this. Uh, believing that at some point in time they're going to go back home and, <laughs> and, and so the idea of citizenship in the United States is oftentimes an afterthought yes. but as generations continue to stay to work to make contributions to the building of this nation mm -hmm. to have second and third and now even fourth generation yes. Caribbean Americans mm -hmm. residing here it has become even more evident in the space of the African diaspora the significance of the Caribbean uh, diaspora within the immigrant population of the United States of America. And therefore, having a national presence enables us to do a few things that perhaps we weren't able to do before. Direct um, attention and policy mm -hmm. towards the relationship between the Caribbean region and the United States. So that, for instance, when there is a, a, a horrible catastrophic earthquake Mm -hmm. in Haiti. Mm -hmm. We can get a rapid response. Exactly. We can have a direct link between the U.S. government uh, and communities uh, that are affected here in the United States, yes. able to get to uh, their homes and their families in, in Haiti. And, and likewise, with all the other uh, Caribbean nations, whether it's uh, concerns about their economy mm -hmm. and how we can leverage our presence here to help uh, with those economic challenges, that's a role that I'm quite honored to be able to play and it, and it makes all the difference when you have it almost as a personal mission uh, to make sure that that relationship between governments uh, is cemented and strengthened. 
Well, we're certainly delighted that um, you have that as you say, personal mission or personal passion, because that means that nobody has to quote unquote fund you to say it, and that's so exciting to know. Or so I would say, not exciting, perhaps heartwarming to know that we have that sort of a person to speak around our issues. On that note, with the um, ongoing immigration conundrum, if you will, yes. with the current state of the immigration <clears throat> debate, the fact that America is a nation of immigrants, where do you think that might end up? I know we're saying it may not end up this year, but how do you think the tone made of the conversation is changing around what America as an immigrant country yes. would look like? Well, I have uh, said to my constituents that the status quo can't hold. Mm -hmm. It may not happen today, it may not happen tomorrow, but ultimately comprehensive immigration reform must occur. Uh, the status quo uh, has created an untenable situation for our communities across the United States where families are being separated due to uh, very strict deportation um, orders and, mm -hmm. and policies. Mm -hmm. uh, we're losing money uh, as we sit here because those who would be able to uh, add their talents to the talent pool of entrepreneurship and uh, skill and expertise uh, are fearful of retribution under a system that no longer works uh, for them or the nation as a whole. And you also have, of course, uh, the need for skilled talent that yes. is educated in the United States and because our system doesn't permit leave the U.S. with that intellectual property to begin competing against the U.S. in other parts of the world. That status quo can't hold. The chambers of commerce have called for comprehensive immigration reform. Just about every system that is a part of the fabric of our country has called for comprehensive immigration reform. Now it's about the political will. Uh, and so I believe it's inevitable. Well, that's certainly one battle for this election here. I think people are going to stay away from. Mm -hmm. um, and I could understand why. Because after all, they say if you're undocumented, you don't vote. But there are probably other issues. What are some other pressing, pressing issues you think of concern to us as Caribbean Americans? Well, as Caribbean Americans, I think the whole idea of climate change is, um, has been talked about uh, is, is real. It's something that our nations face um, on a yearly basis as hurricane season uh, comes into view. Um, certainly the United States, as we look at uh, the dry, arid conditions in the western part of the United States, the uh, excessive flooding that is taking place in the Midwest, in, in the Northeast, um, the concern is now being driven home. And I believe that, that this part, the Western Hemisphere, has a, a real um, interest, mutual interest, in standing up uh, to address this issue. Um, and it's my hope that, as you said, we get through these elections, uh, a real sober conversation comes about. Uh, in New York City, mm -hmm. with Hurricane Superstorm Sandy, we are keenly aware now of what the rise in sea level means for the city of New York. And places that have never flooded uh, were overwhelmed by the waters that came with that superstorm. And so I think we have a far more receptive audience to the whole idea of how we protect ourselves. And then I think that translates into other parts of the of the region, mm -hmm. including the Caribbean, exactly. uh, for that conversation to occur. Well, I'm certainly hoping that um, we at ICS can help to push the conversation forward. In fact, for this year, Cabin American Heritage Month, we are basically launching our environmental sustainability um, projects, one around um, World Ocean Day. On June 8th, World Ocean Day, we'll be organizing um, international telethon, if you will, mm. um, supporting the whole issue of how we share the ocean. And on June 16th in New York, we'll be doing um, an event around the um, climate change conversation. And we certainly want to include 
community leaders around the issue of climate resilience, adaptation, mitigation for homes, and the cost. Because if you look at the mortgage concerns and etc., we, we have insurance. to deal with the issue of how do we finance the, 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 the adaptation practices that poor communities will have to deal with. Exactly. So we certainly hope to work with you around, certainly for the U.S.-based Caribbean American community, a conversation on climate adaptation issues for your district, for example, would be something we would see happening. And perhaps next year, this time, we'll be putting forward the first Caribbean American bill on climate change or well, something. That, it, you know, it's all possible. One of the things that I think is happening in the interim is the vocabulary that is coming forth, the whole idea of the carbon footprint. And what that has meant uh, in terms of looking at renewable sources of energy in the United States, uh, departing from fossil fuels. And that's what has really caused the challenge around this conversation. There's so many interests that have benefited from the status quo that being able to depart from it has been a, a really wrenching um, um, notion for, for many who have profited. But at the same time, we see now that those profits come at a dear cost. And we've got to change that paradigm around, create a new profit motive from renewable fuels that will compel um, Americans and people within the Western Hemisphere to change their ways. Uh, and <laughs> it, it, it's critical to our survival. We're, we're the, uh, scientists are already saying that we're a bit late. We may be a bit too late, um, but we have to you know, struggle and we have to fight for it. Yeah, exactly. So as we come to close, I have a question. Who would you say is your favorite hero or shero in the Caribbean pantheon? of luminaries wow that's a very interesting question because there are just so many i don't i can't say just one i will start with marcus messiah garvey yeah. who um really was um a, a thought leader uh, uh globally mm -hmm. in terms of being a pan-africanist pan he found his way to the united states and sparked a movement that engendered pride in uh africanness at a time when uh you know you you, you could be lynched for reading um so um that gentleman to me um, embodied uh, what I know about the strength and the courage of conviction that comes out of the Caribbean experience. Certainly Shirley Chisholm, very outspoken leader coming out of Brooklyn, New York by way of Guyana and I believe Barbados. Bar it's Barbados, that's right, um, has been um, as the first woman of African descent to serve here in the United States Congress. Yeah, that's um, awesome. A real inspiration for me, knowing that you know, woman power at a time when, um, again, women's rights were very marginalized and just uh, beginning to be uh, awoken in the consciousness of the public. Here you have a black woman uh, who had been schooled in the Caribbean, uh, educated partially, come to the U.S. back to the U.S. to join her family family to be uh, college educated right in Brooklyn at Brooklyn College and uh, rose to such prominence that she could offer herself to be a candidate for the presidency of the United States. Uh, these are the characteristics and the courage of conviction, the ability to, uh, from almost obscurity, uh, find your place mm -hmm. uh, to be able to help others. Are, are what in, inspires me. And of course, um, the home and family from which I come, where mm -hmm. I have two caring, loving parents who, uh, as immigrants to the United States, saw it not robbery to create for my brother and I a village that raised a child, mm -hmm. uh, who were courageous in seeking out uh, the answers, 
to all of the questions that they had about how to navigate <laughs> the systems of the United States to safely uh, create space for my brother and I to grow and to flourish. Um, and so it's a combination of all of those <laughs> and a whole host of unsung heroes yes. that uh, make me proud, uh, particularly when we're celebrating Caribbean American Heritage Month. Yes, I agree. And it's for those unsung heroes while we're here. I want to thank you for coming in. And do you have anything you'd like to add? Yes, I want to thank my colleague, Congresswoman Barbara Lee, because at a time when perhaps uh, she could have done a whole host of other pieces of legislation, she paused to draft a piece of legislation that brings recognition to the presence of people of Caribbean descent called the Caribbean Heritage Month legislation. And her thoughtfulness has created a rallying point, if you will, for people of Caribbean heritage across the United States mm -hmm. to reflect on how far they've come, mm -hmm. to reflect on from whence they've come, mm -hmm. to uh, dig back into those cultural norms and mores that have made them unique among the people that have come to the United States to make it their home. Mm -hmm. And I, I want to thank her uh, mm -hmm. for her vision mm -hmm. um, because it, it has made a, a tremendous difference. I know within my constituency we have celebrations galore. Mm -hmm. And so also <laughs> to acknowledge a few of my colleagues who are here now who are of mm -hmm. Caribbean descent. We have Congressman um, Horsford, Steve Horsford from Nevada, mm -hmm. whose mother comes from Trinidad and Tobago. Mm -hmm. Of course, myself, my parents come from the beautiful island nation of Jamaica. Uh, we have Congresswoman Frederica Wilson, who is descendant of Bahamians. And of course, our US VI representative, Donna Christian Christensen, who will hopefully, we believe, become the next governor of the U.S. Virgin Islands. And we also have Sheila Jackson Lee of Texas, who has both Jamaican and Panamanian roots. So we are fortunate. We are beginning our own Caribbean <laughs> caucus exactly. right here in the United States House of Representatives. Awesome. Well, I want to thank you again for stopping by. It's always a delight to be in your presence and to work with you. Thank you, and Dr. Nelson. And be assured that this Caribbean American Heritage Month will continue to blow the trumpet for a carry-on call. I should say blow the conch shell.